So good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Amy, I use she, her, and I'm happy to have all of you join us today for a great session on Dementia 101. We're very fortunate to have Kim P from the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto speaking with us today. Kim is a caregiver education coordinator at the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto, and she delivers education sessions to increase family caregivers' awareness on Alzheimer's disease and other related dementias, as well as other dementia topics relevant to caregivers. Prior to working at the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto, Kim completed her Master's of Social Work degree with a specialization in health and mental health. As part of her Master's of Social Work practicum, she gained experience in working with physically and cognitively frail older adults at Sunnybrook Health Science Center. She is passionate about raising awareness and support for families, caregivers, and individuals who are affected by Alzheimer's disease and other related dementias. And so I hope that we can all take away a few great tidbits from Kim today. And with that, Kim, I'm happy to hand things over to you. All right, so welcome again, everyone, to today's presentation called Dementia 101. And this is an introduction to Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. So the learning objectives for today, we're going to talk about the difference between Alzheimer's disease and the term dementia. We'll talk about some of the brain changes that happen with someone living with Alzheimer's disease. I will try to show a video, hopefully that works. Then I'll talk about ways that we can support the person's symptoms and their remaining strengths. We'll specifically discuss the seven A's of dementia. And then coming to the end of the presentation, I'll talk a little bit about self-care and how important it is that we take care of ourselves in the role of caregivers. And lastly, I will talk about some of the supports and services available to you in the community specifically. Uh, the ones that we offer through the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto. So we'll start off by asking the question, what is dementia? So a lot of people think that dementia is a specific disease, but it's actually not. Dementia is the umbrella term that we use to describe a set of symptoms that include things like loss of memory, understanding, judgment, and other cognitive abilities, such as changes in mood and behavior. So to give you an analogy, say you're not feeling well, and then you go to the doctor, the doctor might ask you, you know, what are your symptoms? You might tell the doctor that you have a runny nose, a cough, maybe you're sneezing. These are your symptoms, but what is the cause behind these symptoms? It may be that perhaps you have a flu, a cold, or it could be allergies. So similarly with dementia, dementia can be the cause of many different things. One potential cause is Alzheimer's disease, but it's certainly not the only reason why a person may experience these symptoms. Dementia is caused by irreversible disorders that affect the brain. However, there are some conditions that produce symptoms that are similar to dementia, but unlike dementia, these symptoms can actually be treated. So some examples of the treatable or other conditions would include things like delirium, which is characterized by a sudden onset of confusion and sometimes caused by an infection. So with delirium, the symptoms are sort of brought on suddenly. Other conditions may be depression or perhaps alcohol use disorder, maybe sleep disorders, malnutrition, or drug interactions. So these sort of look like dementia with regarding symptoms, but often these conditions are reversible. So when the underlying cause is treated, the symptoms then subside and the person will go back to their baseline level of functioning. So when we talk about dementia, we are referring to, to the irreversible brain disorders, such as Alzheimer's disease and the other ones that I'm about to talk about now. So as you can see, we sort of have this umbrella image here to sort of signify that dementia is the umbrella term. And here we now have the irreversible types. 
And I'll talk briefly about each of these just to give you an idea of what they may look like. So the first one is Alzheimer's disease. And Alzheimer's disease is a fatal progressive degenerative disease that gradually destroys brain cells. Typically what we see with Alzheimer's disease, you may notice some memory loss, changes in mood and behavior. And for some people, they have difficulty performing day-to-day -day tasks. Next, we have frontotemporal dementia. So this affects the frontal lobes of the brain, and these are areas generally associated with our personality and our behavior. So here, when someone has frontotemporal dementia, you may notice more prominently changes in personality and changes in their behavior. So for example, the person may be going from, from a, you know, someone who's very shy to now being very outgoing. Or maybe the opposite, maybe they're very outgoing and now they're very shy. A behavioral change that you may see with frontotemporal dementia, perhaps inappropriate social behavior and lack of insight, such as individual laughing at a funeral. Next, we have Lewy body dementia. So this affects areas of the brain that involve thinking and movement. And there are three common characteristics of this. The first one is that the person would have Parkinson-like symptoms. So this is where we see problems with movement, muscle stiffness, and tremors. The second characteristic would include hallucinations. So seeing or hearing things that are not real. The third one or characteristic would be a fluctuation of symptoms. So with Lewy body dementia, we see memory confusion and language abilities that increase and decrease day to day or hour to hour. So for example, perhaps, you know, let's say your parent or your spouse or whoever it is that you're supporting, maybe you speak to them in the morning and they're able to have a conversation. And then when you call back, you know, a couple hours later, um, they're confused. Um, perhaps their memory is not that well as it was in the morning. So this could be the fluctuation of symptoms piece that we're seeing here with the Lewy body dementia. Next, we have vascular dementia. And this occurs when the brain's blood supply is blocked or damaged, causing brain cells to be deprived of oxygen and die. And this can result after a stroke. For symptoms with vascular dementia, it depends on where the stroke occurs in the brain. So some areas may be more affected than others. With vascular dementia, for example, some symptoms may include changes in their ability to make decisions, to plan and organize, things of that nature. And lastly, we have the crossfelt jakob disease. And this is a rare form of dementia where symptoms progress very quickly and it affects everyone quite differently. The person eventually loses their ability to move and speak and will eventually need full-time care. So symptoms of this type of dementia include loss of memory and thinking. You may notice some unsteady walking and standing, sudden jerky movements, vision problems. The person may be unable to speak or understand speech or they may be in a lot of pain as well. All right, so now we'll talk a little bit about making a diagnosis. What does that look like? So the first thing I wanna say is that there's no specific test that can diagnose dementia. If dementia is suspected, there are a number of physical and cognitive tests that you'll most likely have to go through. So the first thing would be medical history. So the person living with dementia and their family members or friends will be asked questions regarding the person's symptoms, you know, what they were like in the past and what they're like now. And then they will be asked questions about past illnesses and about family, medical, and psychiatric history as well. Then there's the mental status exam. So this part of, you know, this little battery of tests sort of looks at the person's sense of time and place and their ability to remember, express themselves, and do simple calculations. 
So for example, they may be given exercises such as, you know, recalling words and objects or drawing and spelling. Or they may be asked questions such as, what year was it? Then there's a physical exam. And this is done to help rule out any other causes. A physical exam will be done to perhaps look at your heart, the person's lung, liver, kidneys or thyroid problems that may be causing the symptoms. There are also laboratory tests. So here detailed blood work will be ordered to help detect problems such as anemia, diabetes, thyroid problems again, looking for infections, and all of these things that may be contributing to the symptoms that we're seeing. There may be a psychiatric evaluation or exam that needs to be done as well to rule out other illnesses such as depression, which can also cause symptoms similar to Alzheimer's disease. And then perhaps you may have to get a neuropsychological test completed as well. So that looks at memory, reasoning, writing, things like that. So this is sort of what the process may look like. For some people, they go through all of these. For other people, maybe just a couple of things. But it's really just a process of perhaps looking to see if there are any treatable conditions that can be sort of managed so that the symptoms will subside or just going through the process to see if in fact this is Alzheimer's disease or dementia or another type of dementia. So here we talk a little bit about early diagnosis and why it's important. And I'm just gonna show you a quick video here. So just bear with me one moment as I pull it up. And this video is from an individual named Linda who talks about early diagnosis. All right, so that video Linda talks a little bit about the importance of early diagnosis, but also some of the benefits of early diagnosis. So for example, she talked about being able to understand what may be going on for the person. You know, what are these symptoms? Why are they happening? So getting that diagnosis, she was able to understand for herself. Also getting support earlier on and how that can benefit her and her family and the person that she's supporting. For example, getting access to resources, planning ahead, and getting that education can help contribute to that better quality of life for both the person living with dementia, but also for the family and everyone involved in their care. Now we'll talk a little bit about the 10 warning signs of Alzheimer's disease. So we just talked about, you know, getting an early diagnosis, why that's important. So how do we even get to that step of looking for a diagnosis? So these are some warning signs that we wanted to share with you all. And I'll also be sending a link with this information. So um, you will have that readily available as well as the slides. So if you see any of these in the person that you're supporting, you may want to connect with your doctor um, or your physician to perhaps inquire about, you know, is this Alzheimer's disease? The first thing you may notice is that the person, the person's memory is impacted. They may have the memory loss that affects their sort of day-to-day -day abilities. For example, forgetting things often, or maybe they're not able to retain new information. The second sign, perhaps they're having difficulty performing tasks that are familiar to them, such as preparing a meal or getting themselves dressed. The third sign, you may notice that they're having problems with their language. And when I say this, I mean they're forgetting words or they're substituting words that don't really fit the context of what they're saying. The fourth sign, you may notice that they're having some problems with orientation to time and space. So they may not know perhaps what day of the week it is. Or maybe they're getting lost in a familiar place like the home or maybe they used to go to a mall every afternoon for a walk. Maybe they're now getting lost in that mall. The fifth sign is impaired judgment. So perhaps they're not recognizing a medical problem that needs attention. Or as you see in this image here, the individual is wearing light clothing on a cold day. So uh, not wearing any mitts, not wearing any 
uh, boots or a uh, warm jacket. So you may notice this, and this could be perhaps attributed to their impaired judgment. The sixth sign is problems with abstract thinking. So you may notice that the person you're supporting is having trouble understanding what numbers are and what they're used for. The seventh sign, you may notice that the individual is misplacing things. And when we say this, we're talking about, you know, putting things in strange places. Like you see in the image, putting a dress in the refrigerator or a wristwatch in the sugar bowl. The eighth sign you may notice would be changes in their mood and their behavior. So maybe you're seeing some, some mood swings or perhaps they've gone from being a very easygoing person to now, now being very quick tempered. The ninth sign you may notice would be perhaps changes in personality. So maybe they're behaving really out of character, perhaps becoming suspicious or fearful. And the 10th sign is a loss of initiative. Maybe they're losing interest in spending time with their friends, their family, or maybe they're even losing interest in doing things that they once enjoyed or their favorite activities. So if you're noticing any of these signs in the person that you're supporting, you may wanna reach out to your doctor just to inquire and find out, could it be Alzheimer's disease? So now I wanna talk a little bit about the brain changes that takes place in Alzheimer's disease. And I'm gonna show you a video that can explain it way better than I can. And I'll also be linking the video to you as well so you can watch it again after. So just bear with me one moment as I pull. All right, so that was just a very quick video about the brain and how Alzheimer's disease is sort of impacting the brain. All right, so just making sure you're able to see my slides again, Amy, if you can just give me a thumbs up, perfect. Yeah, so just to reiterate some things, you know, with the healthy brain, we see that messages are sent by these electrical impulses and then they're passed from one neuron to the next. And this process takes place for everything that the body sees, interprets, and does. With the person living with Alzheimer's disease, in their brain, there are two structures that are contributing to the changes. And we heard about the plaques and the tangles. So if you do have any more additional questions about Alzheimer's disease in the brain and what that looks like, I highly encourage you to take a look again at the video. But just one more thing I wanted to share with you is that we also see a lot of shrinkage in the brain for someone with Alzheimer's disease. So as you can see here, we're looking at the two photos. The one on the right is someone's brain who has advanced Alzheimer's disease, and the other one is that of someone with a healthy brain. So not only are we seeing shrinkage, but we're seeing larger gaps. And those gaps are the consequences of cell death. And this just shows that the functions of those brain areas will not be efficient or functional. So this picture is here to really remind us that Alzheimer's disease is a physical disease of the brain. And in the advanced stages, the brain can lose a third of its mass. So here we have the, the journey. What does it look like? This is a visual reminder that the disease is progressive and will continue to get worse and may even end in death. So we see here that some people may experience forgetfulness or repetitive questions, problems with self-care and continence issues, maybe lose their communication abilities. Some people may experience all of these, some people some, but it's different for everyone. But this is just an illustration of what the journey may look like. So now we're gonna switch gears a little bit and I'm gonna talk about the seven A's of dementia. And we'll be looking at each of these a little bit more closely. So these are amnesia, aphasia, agnosia, apraxia, anosognosia, 
altered perception and apathy. And these are sort of some of the things that we see, some of the characteristics that we see in the people living with dementia that we are supporting. So let's start with amnesia. Amnesia really means memory loss. So when we're talking about memory loss, we're talking about short-term memory and long-term memory. And as you see here on the slide, it says last memories in are the first ones lost. So this means that if you tell them to, you know, warm up their food in the microwave for a couple of minutes, they may not remember what you told them. But if you're asking them about a memory that happened in their past, maybe their wedding day, they will remember that. So the Last memories in, meaning the one that you just did, would be the first ones um, that are lost. And because of this, the person may become very repetitive because they may not remember what you just told them, or they may not remember that they just asked you the question that they have to ask. Some strategies that can help us with amnesia can be to perhaps follow a daily schedule. Maybe if you're asking them to take medication or to eat at certain times, perhaps having that schedule laid out on a calendar. So when they come down, they can see that laid out. They know what's sort of coming up. Another thing is to use signs around the home. They may not remember, you know, where the washroom is or where the bedroom is. You can also put up pictures in the room of their family members, their friends, people who are important to them. The second A is aphasia. And aphasia means loss of language. This includes the loss of the ability to speak or understand spoken, written, or sign language. So the person may not be aware that their speech does not make sense to others. And there are two types of aphasia. There's expressive and receptive. With expressive, aphasia, the person living with dementia has difficulty expressing themselves or finding the right words and putting the right words in the right order to form words or sentences. With receptive aphasia, the person has difficulty understanding what others are saying. And this can make conversations overwhelming for a person living with dementia. They can easily become lost in the conversation. And because of that, you may notice that they're withdrawing a little bit more. For some people, they may revert back to their first language. And this can also be because of the amnesia. They may not remember when they learned English. So they may go back to speaking their mother tongue language. And for some folks, they may become mute. So what are some strategies here? We can perhaps really focus on nonverbal communication, such as using gestures or using touch, smiling, speaking slowly and giving them more time to respond may be a strategy as well. The third A is agnosia. So this is the loss of ability to recognize whether it be objects, people, sounds, or places. So when it comes to objects, if the person is not able to recognize certain objects, it can lead to safety issues if they're unable to use the item appropriately. So for example, if someone sees a fork and thinks it's a comb and they're sort of combing their hair, if they press really hardly, are really hard, sorry, they can dig into their scalp and that can be dangerous for them. What about people? They may not recognize themselves in the mirror sometimes, or they may not recognize other people such as their children, their grandchildren, their spouse. For some people who experience agnosia, they lose their ability to recognize sounds or they misinterpret what's heard and that can cause them some distress. It can cause them to feel fearful. And then places. If they're unable to recognize places, they may become lost in places that were once familiar to them. Whether it be a grocery store that they perhaps used to go to all the time, or maybe even in their own home. 
So some strategies for this could be, you know, demonstrating how to use an object if it's an object or keeping things, dangerous objects or items that could be dangerous sort of out of sight, out of reach. Um, another thing, if they're becoming lost in familiar places, using those cues, those arrows, putting up signs in certain places, even if it's at the home, things of that nature. Next, we have apraxia. So apraxia is the loss of purposeful movement. When someone's experiencing apraxia, they lose their ability to plan, to sequence, and to carry out the steps of a task. Specifically complex tasks, such as banking, cooking, dressing, all of these things, these complex tasks can become quite overwhelming for the person. We often see that you know, their sense of space eventually gets impacted and they may not know, you know front to back or left to right. And because of that, they may become very dependent on family members, on healthcare providers for their support with their activities of daily living, such as showering, getting dressed, things of that nature. And some strategies here with apraxia could be to break down tasks into smaller steps. Perhaps you need to just go one thing at a time with the individual. You may need to have adaptive clothing. For example, using Velcro instead of zippers or buttons, that may be helpful. And maybe when you are giving them instructions, you can try to reduce any background noise or any distractions that may be there when you're giving them instructions on, you know, put your jacket on. What is the first step? When you're breaking down those steps, just making sure that, you know, it isn't a crowded area. There aren't things like the TV on in the background, making sure that the person is able to focus on what you're telling them. The fifth A we have is anosognosia. So here, this is where there's loss of knowledge of the illness. So the person might not be aware of the symptoms they're experiencing. And this could be due to the damage in their brain as a result of cell death. It's not the same thing as denial. So the person doesn't know that they don't know. And this could be also attributing to their loss of judgment. They may not actually be aware of the changes in their abilities. So they may refuse help. They may say, you know, I'm functioning fine. I don't have memory issues. So with this, some strategies would be to, you know, not don't try to convince your loved ones that they have dementia. You may just want to try your best to be creative, to make changes, to help them live safely. You may not need to tell them, you know, I'm doing this because you have memory problems. Perhaps you can maybe not give a reason or give another reason. That's also true. And try to be discreet and choose your battles. Let go of, you know, what's, let go of whatever it is, you know, if it's not an immediate safety issue, perhaps it can be put off to another time. So again, here, the person doesn't know that they don't know. Then we have altered perception. And this is sort of like misinterpretations. Here, we see the person having illusions and hallucinations. So an illusion is when they see something and misinterpret it as something else. So they may see a coat rack and perceive it as a person standing there staring at them. And a hallucination is where the person is seeing or perceiving something that is not there. So they may be seeing or hearing an animal or another person. With this altered perception, we also notice that a lot of people do experience this loss in their depth perception. So they're not able to tell the depth of something like the bathtub. For some people, there's a loss of ability to distinguish between 3D and 2D objects. There may be a loss of color and visual perception as well. So these are just some things to bring to our attention that, you know, may not be as noticeable for us, but these are things that they may be experiencing. So some strategies, perhaps the first thing is just to make sure that, you know, they have their eyes checked. They're wearing the correct, you know, if they are wearing glasses, making sure that it's, you know, an up-to-date prescription that they're using. 
and trying your best, you know, to help them with the depth perception. You can have, for example, a different colored toilet seat that they might see. For some people that's helpful using a brown toilet seat may be helpful or some people use a red toilet seat. Sometimes when the floor, the toilet seat and the walls are all white, they may not be able to sort of see the change. And the final A, number seven is apathy. And this is referring to a loss of motivation. The person may lose their ability to initiate an activity, in some cases, even if they're interested. So perhaps it's due to motivation. If they're not motivated, try to get them to do things that they enjoy specifically. If it is, it, you know, something happening in their brain where they're actually not able to start the activity, you may have to give them some assistance or to help them get started. You may need to, you know, put that pen in their hand or put the fork in their hand. For some people, you know, family members think, you know, there's an improvement here. When they're noticing fewer responsive behaviors, like the person's not yelling or swearing or, you know, hitting as much as they used to, maybe they're improving. But in fact, it could be that, you know, that start button in their brain that, that you know, that frontal lobe tells the motor cortex to, you know, do something, maybe that's not working. So just being very mindful that when it comes to apathy, it could be either or. All right, so those are the seven A's of dementia. And that just gives us a little insight into some things that we may be seeing in the person or people that we're supporting. And we also highlighted some strategies. So I will be also sending out a link um, that can help you to, to learn a little bit more about the seven A's and also some additional strategies. Now looking at medications or talking about medications. There are four drugs approved in Canada right now that are available. And here they are on the slide. We have Aricept, Reminil, Exelon, and Abija. And just some notes about these medications. We know that with these medications, we do see some slower decline compared to those who do not use medication. So that's again, going back to the importance of early diagnosis. These benefits to the medication are usually um, most impacted when the person is earlier on in the stage, stages of dementia. They don't cure the dementia and they don't affect the underlying degenerative process. They sort of just speak to or help with the symptoms. And some symptoms that benefit from these medications are things like agitation or apathy, some things to do with their cognition, and perhaps some of them may help with hallucinations as well. We do wanna say here though, that the benefits are temporary and you wanna be mindful of any side effects that may happen with these medications. So if medication is something that you are considering, we do encourage you to speak to your pharmacist or your doctor for more information. There are also non-drug approaches that you may want to consider. For example, home safety assessment. So this is where you have an occupational therapist coming into the home to conduct a home safety assessment just to ensure that the person is living safely. So they may recommend things such as, you know, adaptive utensils or grab bars for the person to hold on to or handrails. Uh, so whatever it is, the occupational therapist will be able to help ensure that they are living safely in their home environment. We also recommend the Medic Alert Safely Home Program. So the Medic Alert Safely Home Program is a nationwide program that's designed to help identify the person who is lost and assist in a safe return home. We also recommend labeling and queuing. So maybe you need to label where plates are or where the washrooms are. Perhaps you need to cue, so use arrows so they can follow you know, the direction. Where's the washroom? Where's the bedroom? Where's the basement? Where's the front door? Another approach that may be helpful would be using calendars or blister packs, especially when it comes to thinking about appointments or medication. So when you have a calendar, you're able to tell, you know, when was your last appointment? When is your upcoming appointment? 
Or even if you're noticing certain behaviors, noting those on the calendar, you know, I noticed that, you know, usually this happens every time they take this drug or whatever it is, being able to track things on the calendar. Also blister packs allows us to remember if the person took their medication. If you notice that it's still there, you know, under the, the lunch packet or the lunch column, you're thinking, okay, I guess, you know, dad didn't take his meds today. Incontinence products, that's maybe something that you want to look into. So do, does the individual need briefs? And we always encourage people to engage with advanced care planning. So here you're talking about what are the person's or the family's desires and wishes? What would they like to happen in the event that they're unable to make decisions? So if they're in the very early stages of dementia, you know, perhaps you're still able to have these conversations, you know, mom, when you're unable to make decisions on your own, what would you like me to do for you? So that, you know, you're able to hear what they would like and you're able to help advocate for them. So they, their wishes are able to sort of come, come true for them. And then also considering palliative care. What would they like to see near the end of life stages? Would they like to be in hospital? Would they like to be at home? Would they like to have, you know, someone from their cultural or religious group present? Would they like to have their family members present? So these are just some non-drug approaches that we do like to sort of put on your radar to think about as you go through the dementia journey. And having said all of that, you know, everyone's different. So here's a quote that we like to share. And it says, if you have met one person with dementia, you've only met one person. That is, each individual will talk, act, remember, and behave differently, not simply because of what stage of dementia they're in, but because they are who they are. So this really highlights the fact that each person is unique and each person with dementia is unique. They will have a unique combination of weaknesses and strengths. And we want to remember to focus on the person rather than the disease. And we really like this quote because it focuses on the person and this idea of person-centered care, their likes, their morals, their dislikes, their values. And just remembering that, you know, although dementia has stages, every single person will sort of present differently, even if they're in the same stage. And we want to make sure that we are focusing on their remaining strengths. Look for those preserved strengths in the individual and capitalize on those areas. So, for example, do they have a sense of humor? Is this something that you can tap into? Is there anything that we can laugh about? What about their long-term memory? Earlier I talked about amnesia and their long-term memory being intact longer than their short-term memory. So perhaps, you know, meeting them where they're at, looking through photo albums with them or singing songs together from their past that they enjoyed, personalized music. You may also want to Focus on their primary motor skills, if they're able to walk and exercise using those larger muscles. What about their social abilities? Are they still able to socialize with family members and friends? Is this something that they enjoy? And really providing opportunities for that if they're, if they're able to. You also want to focus on their emotional awareness and memory. Some people may not remember what you said to them but we know that their emotional memory is also intact. So they will remember how you made them feel. And try your best to incorporate the senses. So for example, if you wanna engage in a meaningful activity with them, perhaps you can you know, play a game like guess that scent where you have different scents, you allow them to smell it and you have them guess you know, what that scent is. And of course you use scents that they're familiar with. So we always talk about, you know, the losses, you know, this person is no longer able to do this or they can't do that anymore. But we really want to reframe how we're thinking about things and remember, you know, what are they still able to do and how can I highlight that? 
I also wanted to tell you all about the Canadian Charter of Rights for People Living with Dementia. So here's a little video. I won't have time to show you the video today, but I will be sending it out in that email. It's just a YouTube link. I think it's about 15 or 20 minutes. And I'll also be sending you a document, the PDF file, so you can sort of read through that as well. And we encourage you to watch this video. It was created by the Alzheimer's Society of Canada with people living with dementia. So I'll be sending that link out as well. Here we have some insights from the person. What's it like for them? What are some thoughts that they have? Some people said, acknowledge my disease. Don't pretend that nothing is wrong. I still need my family and friends. Don't treat me like a child. Learn about this disease. Take time to listen. Don't stare at me strangely. Give me some space. Let me continue to do the things that I can still do. Give me time to do things and remember me. So these are just some insights from people living with dementia, some things that they've shared. And it's a great memory. It's a great thing to keep in mind, to keep up you know, at the forefront of our mind when we're communicating with the person or when we're sort of in the same space of them, with them. We wanna remember who they are, respect them and keep these things in mind. Here we have some approaches that we can use to help enrich their quality of life. So just a couple things, you may want to engage with, with them through reminiscence and validation. So again, looking through those photo albums together, validating some of their, their feelings and the emotions that they're having. At the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto, we have the Minds in Motion. This is a program that we offer and that incorporates physical activity and mental stimulation for people living with dementia in the early to mid stages and their care partners. So this is where you can engage with, you know, physical and social activities with the person. And you'll be able to find some of these on our event calendar, which I'll be sending out as well after today's presentation. Some more approaches that will enhance quality of life include that nonverbal communication or communication through other senses. As I mentioned earlier, some people are not able to, you know, verbally communicate with us. They may have aphasia, or maybe they're, they're just not able to communicate for any other reason. But we know that nonverbal communication, you know, a simple smile can go a long way. It can help them to feel comforted. It can help them to feel safe. And then there are other senses that you can communicate with them through, such as touch, maybe music, through the sound, maybe visually, maybe communicating by looking through art together. So these are some things that you can do to help enrich their quality of life. So I mentioned music, you can, you know, perhaps a massage, aromatherapy, pet therapy, doll therapy, painting and photography. These are some things that may be enjoyable to the person, maybe even gardening or watching the sunsets, holding hands with the individual. Some people find them very comforting. And again, going back to that quote, you know, each person is different. This is just sort of a toolbox of things that you can pull from. And the person may change day to day, hour to hour. One day they may like one thing, the other day they may like something else. So it's just about, you know, building in our toolbox and being flexible in terms of how we can support them. All right, so now I wanted to talk a little bit about self-care here, just talking about the fact that self-care is a priority and necessity. It is not a luxury in the work that we do as caregivers. So we have an analogy here where we ask you all to imagine yourself as a pitcher of water. And imagine, you know, there's a pitcher of water and there are four glasses in front, in front of you. You are the pitcher of water and each glass in front of you represents a responsibility of yours, whether it be, you know, taking care of your own children or grandchildren, whether it be, you know, meal prep, grocery shopping, you know, your own job, whatever it is. 
you as the pitcher, you're continuously pouring into these glasses. The glasses are getting full, but you're becoming empty. The water is running out. What is it that you need to do to refuel that pitcher with water? So that's just a little brief analogy to help us to understand, you know, we're constantly pouring out into other people, other responsibilities, but in the process, we are getting empty. So we need to take care of ourselves. It is absolutely a priority and a necessity. It's our way of recharging. And it's important for us to consider and think about what is it that I need to do to recharge? For some people, it's you know taking a nap for 20 minutes. For other people, it's going for a 30 minute jog or maybe reading a book, listening to music, watching something on Netflix. Maybe it's adult coloring for a couple minutes. For some people, it's, you know, stepping away out of the room and taking, doing some deep breathing exercises just for one minute. But self-care looks different for everyone. It is about figuring out what works for you. What is it that you need to do to recharge on a daily basis? All right, so that's it for me. So now I'll talk a little bit about some of the programs and services before I open the floor up to any questions. The first thing I wanted to tell you about at the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto would be our counseling, our support groups, and our care navigation. So at the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto, we have free and confidential counseling. So you'd be able to speak with one of our highly trained social workers one-on-one -on -one, to discuss things like communication strategies, how to reduce caregiver stress, how to cope with responsive behaviors, getting that diagnosis, finding community support services, and just for that emotional support as you may be transitioning into the role of caregiver. We also have support groups where you can connect with people going through similar situations to that of your own. And it's great to connect with other people to share resources, experiences. We also have care navigators. So if you're looking for a, a service and you're having difficulty navigating the healthcare system, our care navigators can assist you in finding what you're looking for and perhaps provide you with a list um, that you can start with. We also have education, training and information. So we offer Zoom workshops at the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto, similar to uh, what we're having today. And we also offer webinars on our alleducate.ca platform. So that's a website that you would go to. You can watch our webinars live or you can watch recordings that we have as well. We also have a lot of information and reading material on the Alzheimer's Society of Canada website. I also wanted to tell you a little bit about the active living programs. So these provide meaningful opportunities for social inclusion for the person living with dementia and their caregiver. And you'll see uh, some opportunities on the event calendar when I send that out to you at the end. We also have the Medical Alert Safely Home Program uh, partnership. This is something that we always recommend to people. Um, so I mentioned earlier that it is a program designed to help identify the person who was lost. And then I wanted to tell you about the music project. So the music project is personalized music for people living with dementia. So the Alzheimer's Society Music Project reconnects people with the soundtrack of their lives by providing music players loaded with personalized music to the person living with dementia. Here we have some of the possible benefits of personalized music. Some people have said that, you know, they've noticed some increased communication, physical activity and social activity in the person that they're supporting, improved mood, sleep and cognition. For some people, these songs reignite older memories and it increases their overall quality of life. So if you are interested in this program, here you see what they would, what you would receive in the music package. You'll get a personalized music player, a set of over the ear headphones, one wall charger, a charging cable, and an instruction booklet. One thing we wanna highlight here is that music is beneficial in all stages of dementia in the very early stages, the middle stages, but also the very late and palliative stages as well. There is eligibility criteria for the program. So the person does need to have a suspected or diagnosed dementia or cognitive impairment. 
They must live in the M postal code, either the recipient or their family or friend. They must agree to use the program materials as directed to return the materials to us when the original recipient is uh, no longer using it. And then to provide us with feedback so that we can continue to improve our programs and services. So if you are interested in this program, you can also always take a look at the website www.musicproject.ca or you can phone into our main line at 416-322-6560 and then you can ask them about it there as well. You will be getting a copy of the slides so you'll have all of this information readily available to you as well. And I also wanted to tell you about the Finding Your Way program. So the Finding Your Way program is a province-wide program. The target group of this program include people living with dementia, their caregivers, and the general community. Finding Your Way aims to raise public awareness of the risk of people living with dementia going missing. Finding Your Way encourages families to create a safety plan, which includes filling out an identification kit that can be handed to the police if the person does go missing. And Finding Your Way also supports the safe return of people who do go missing by providing tip sheets and information on what to do during and after a missing incident. So why is this program so important? Right now, there are actually 240,000 people in Ontario living with dementia. Six out of 10 of these people will go missing, often without warning. Half of those not found within 24 hours will be gravely injured or die. And in urban areas, 75% of missing individuals are found within 3.2 kilometers of their last location seen. So this really puts into perspective why this program is so important, not only for you know, us and the people that we're supporting, but also for anyone, anyone that we may see, you know, maybe it's, it is actually important if you notice someone who may be living with dementia, who may be lost, we want to be able to support them to help them find their way back home. And there are also program materials that you can access on the website, www.findingyourwayontario.ca. And there are materials available on the website in all of the languages that you see here, both reading material, but also videos in these languages that show real stories of people living with dementia and their families on their dementia journey. So we highly recommend this program. If you are interested, you can take a look at the website and you'll be able to find all of the material and videos there. All right, so that's it for me. So thank you everyone for taking the time to attend today's presentation.